It's time for the 2025.5 release of Home Assistant. Lots of new goodies and stuff inside the release, so I'll take you quickly through it. Let's get started. Before I jump into the internals of what's new in this release of Home Assistant, let me talk about a milestone that the Home Assistant team has reached, and that's 2 million active installations of Home Assistant worldwide. Now they're gonna celebrate that with a community day on Saturday, May the 24th, 2025. If you're watching this video after that date, it's already passed, so don't worry about that. But if you haven't seen it yet, there are a lot of meetups that are being put together by a lot of the Home Assistant community. And you can see all of the different areas where we have stuff set up or where they have stuff set up to go. And these are being hosted by local community members of Home Assistant, not necessarily the Home Assistant or Nabucasa teams. So look through this page. And if you're interested, make sure you sign up for one of these meetups um, and enjoy just some camaraderie, some uh, socialize with some of the other Home Assistant users out there. So congratulations to 2 million Home Assistant installations worldwide, and I am looking forward to more of those going in. Home Assistant is an amazing platform and I really have enjoyed using it over the years. All right, let's talk about the very first thing that's going on in the new Home Assistant release and that is improvements to backups. There's a couple things that they've done in the backups, one of which is the ability to set retention based on device. If you have multiple devices in your Home Assistant installation and you're backing up to these different locations, then you can choose the retention based on the particular device. So for example, if I only wanna keep um, a certain number of backups on my Synology NAS, for example, or if you're using Google Drive or something that has limited retention, you can either choose to use the global settings. And if you look over here, the global settings are set up here. Uh, retention is either custom, forever, or whatever you wanna set there. Uh, or you can come over here and you can actually change this to the custom. Let's say I wanna keep um, 10 backups. So then I would save it for only 10 backups for the Synology device that I have. Now, let me check something here. Yeah, you can only still ever store one backup in the cloud. All of the older backups are deleted. So that one doesn't give you an option for change and retention. However, any of the other ones you do store on. Um, so I have limited space on this one. I only wanna store, let's say I wanna store two on this. So two on this device and you know 10 on the Synology or whatever. Those are changes to the backup retention. Now there's another setting in here that they added that allows you to set your back, backup preference when updating. When you do an update, you will see the little box showing up asking you if you want to select a backup or not. Let me see if I have any backups or anything to update here. So you'll typically see keep backup of the latest version. And this, is, this was before toggled to off by default. If you're one of those people that likes to automatically back up everything without having to hit the toggle button, it's basically a quality of life improvement. It allows you to set that default so it can back up uh, automatically or be set to back up automatically. So if I go back into my backups and I go to my settings, uh, you will be able to set that here, right? So you can set uh, the backup preference to either backup before update or skip backups. And that will just set that toggle to automatically change to set it for backing up Im uh, immediately without having you ha without you having to set it. Now this setting is only for the Home Assistant operating system update. It doesn't change the settings on the individual add-ons when you back those up. So if I click on one of these here, it didn't toggle that to automatically on when I had it set that way. So this is only for the Home Assistant OS backup. Now if you go back over to settings, you can change this for add-ons as well, so let me just go do that right now. Let's go to settings and history. And where you have the, the OS automatic backups up here, you go down here, you can see that you have the add-on update backups. You can do the same thing where you can go to backup before update always. And then you can also set your retention for individual add-ons. So if you do an individual add-on backup before you go ahead, and do an update, then it, you can set the number of backups to keep on your system so it doesn't fill it up with all those old backups. So now that I've set that, if I go back over here to settings for the backups, hopefully, yep, 
it automatically sets that to on. Now I don't like that necessarily. Only Z-Wave and Zigbee are the two that I typically will back up anyway. So let me just go back over to backups here and we will set that back to where it was before where it defaults to the off state because I don't want to do that. So skip backups and I'm going to keep two of those things. So there we go. That's how you can do that with uh, the add-ons as well. So you have the OS settings up here for HA or Home Assistant OS setting backups and the retention for that. And then you have the uh, add-on update backups with the backup uh, preference and the number of backups to keep. And one other thing that they've done is if you are running a backup and you try to restart Home Assistant in the middle of a backup, it will now tell you that you are um, backing it up and to wait until it's finished. So you'll see that here. Um, if it says that if you're trying to restart, it'll say wait for the backup creation to finish. So you'll be able to uh, prevent yourself from restarting the Home Assistant operating system in the middle of a backup, which could be a problem because sometimes you don't get a lot of feedback on the backup process. And you might try to run a backup in the middle or run a restart in the middle of a backup, which then destroys the backup. And if that was your only backup, man, then you're messed up. So another new feature they've added in this release as Home Assistant is the ability to play back voices in different, I don't know, um, I don't even know what the word is, different um, formats, different ways. If you're part of the Home Assistant cloud, you get that backup stuff I just showed you. Um, to the to the cloud, you get backup regardless, but you get backup to the cloud. And then you also get uh, this ability to play these voices in different styles. Uh, you, For example, you've got assistant, style, chat, customer service, angry, newscast, all these different ones. So let me, let me try angry here. And we'll just say, um, that, thanks for watching. Let's see what it sounds like. Thanks for watching. Yeah, man, it sounds a little angry. Let's let's go with cheerful and see what that sounds like. Thanks for watching. For watching. Mm, okay. And let's see, what about the newscast? It may be too short of a voice prompt for this one. Thanks for watching. See you next time. How about that? Thanks for watching. See you next Thanks. time on channel four. Thanks for watching. See you next time on channel four. Man, I should have taken that pause out of there. Uh, let's just try a couple more here. Um, oh, this will be a fun one. How about terrified? I'm so scared. <laughs> That's pretty good. That actually sounds pretty good. Uh, they're chasing me. I'm so scared. They're chasing me. Oh, that is pretty, that is pretty good there. Um, how about sad? I ran out of my favorite drink. I ran out of my favorite drink. Oh, well, anyway, so... You could play around with this all you want to and just, um, how about whispering? I don't know if that works and just, just have fun with it. Be quiet in the library. Be quiet in the library. <laughs> okay. Anyway, that's an improvement they've done to voice to give you the ability to, uh, choose all kinds of different voice assistant styles to replay back on your voice assistants. Now, I'm doing it on the computer, but you can also do it on uh, your voice assist devices as well. I believe it plays out to those. So you can kind of listen to all those different prompts or different styles on your voice assistants. And you could script it to do different things based on conditions or states of whatever, uh, entities or whatever. So that's very interesting. So next up is another UI kind of uh, quality of life improvement that they've made. And this is, has to do with the pickers that you get when you're working on something um, in the kind of the drop downs that are in the different areas of Home Assistant. So for example, if we take and look at an automation here, I'm just creating a brand new automation. It doesn't really matter what it is. In the automation, if I wanna uh, change something or do something when uh, the state or entity, let me say that again, when I wanna call, uh, let me say it a third time. 
when I want to change something based on a state or an attribute and I'm looking for a specific entity, let's say I'm looking for a light, but I can't remember exactly what the light name is. I do know where it is. I want to trigger the light in the kitchen, right? So if I go and put light and I probably don't have a kitchen light. Yeah, I do. Here we go. Um, well, let me, let me back up here. It's probably better, right? Let me look for, um, something else here. How about a lamp? If I'm looking for a lamp and I'm not sure where, it, which lamp it is, but I know where it is like this one here in the master bedroom or main bedroom, I now have this little dialogue at the bottom that gives me a, another clue as to which one this is. The goal is that eventually, um, they will go through and you probably heard that little noise. Uh, eventually you'll be able to just choose a light or a switch or something. And I might have 10,000 switches, but I'm going to be able to tell you where that particular switch is because it gives me this little bit of extra context down at the bottom of the screen. And they talk about it in their blog here, probably better than I just did. Uh, but essentially, um, they are improving the context provided with the entity pickers in the UI. It's a drop down. And when you select an entity, for example, a card or automation or script, the picker shows you the device name and area name as well. So I have in the bedroom, the device name. So I could just say, in this case, just say temperature. And then all of this stuff, you'd have all the different rooms that the temperature would be in. So let's see if I actually have a temperature. That's actually a pretty good example because I do have a lot of temperature devices. They're all over the place. I can never quite remember which one it is. So if I have an area specified like garage, this is the garage temperature, the Xiaomi, Xiaomi. I'm going to get flame for that one. Uh, these don't have areas. You can see why an area assignment is important. This does tell me it's a dining room temperature. However, in the future, if you set an area and you only have one device in that area or temperature, for example, if you set the area properly in your home assistant configuration, a lot of other stuff benefits from that. I'm learning that areas are super important. Not something I really cared about early on in my home assistant days, but much more so now. So if you set an area and it's called temperature, and then you say dining temperature, or in this case, garage, and this is the temperature in the garage, I don't really care what the device is. This is my temperature sensor in the garage. And so they've added an ability to filter down into that and see a little bit better context on the things you're selecting and make it easier for you to find what you're looking for. And I'll tell you why that's important. If I haven't already explained it enough, if I look at my entities list here, I just have the gazillion entities in here and, you know, finding something out of this, I don't even know how many are in here, 3,087 entities or entity pieces or parts. That's, pretty hard having the ability to look at that context when you're choosing an entity and know where it is and what it is, is very, very helpful. So that's a, a nice step forward in the UI design that they're work, they have added to this release of home assistant. So next up, we have some improvements to Z-Wave. Let me just talk through what they've posted in the blog post, because I don't have a good way to display this. I'm not, I don't have anything to add right now in terms of devices. So let's just talk through it. There's some new enhancements. Uh, apparently they're working on a uh, Z-Wave antenna, which I didn't know about it. It says not so secret, but somebody must know about it because apparently it's not so secret. So in this release, they're improving the whole setup process for new Z-Wave devices. So you can do that by spending, uh, scanning the smart start QR code. Um, and that works natively in your mobile companion app. So if you have the iOS app or the Android app, uh, you can do that. In addition to that, added devices are immediately visible in Home Assistant, even if the device is not powered on yet. Once you turn it on or it gets rebooted, it automatically gets added to your Z-Wave network. That's interesting. So you can take something out of the box, scan the QR code on it, get it added in Home Assistant, and then when you're ready to turn it on, boom, turn it on and it adds itself in. That'll be a, an interesting exercise once I have something else to add to that. The other thing they've done is the addition of Z-Wave long range support. Uh, if you've been doing Z-Wave at all, you know that Z-Wave LR has been out for a little bit of time now, and now it's being added to Home Assistant. Long range is what it says. It allows your devices to transmit and receive over a longer distance, which means they can go directly back to the Z-Wave hub rather than going over the mesh network. 
Whether that's more reliable or not just depends on your environment, whether or not you have interference. You might be able to connect to something long range uh, for a few times and then it fails because something gets in the way and interferes. Sometimes mesh networks are better. But what they've given you the ability to do in adding the device is either to go direct long range. So you're going to have a direct connection to Home Assistant without going through the mesh network. And by the way, Z-Wave is a mesh network. You have powered on, always powered on devices. Typically, they will form a network of devices so that everything kind of talks together. If you don't want to use that and you want to go directly to something that's always you think is going to be stable. For example, if you have something outside of your mailbox for a sensor or something like that, you want to connect directly to it instead of trying to back way through the mesh network, then you can do that. Or you can just set it to use the mesh network, which then relays the signals to each other and that enhances coverage and also reliability. Um, it says after scanning the QR code of an LR device, you will get the option to either add it to the existing mesh or go directly. Obviously both have pros and cons. Mesh networking is recommended for most devices, but if you need to put something far away, long range might be the better option, which is kind of what I just said. All right, so that is the Z-Wave update that uh, they've done in Home Assistant for this release. And then you can read through all these noteworthy changes. A couple other things on here since the video is course long, as always. Uh, dashboard uh, badges now can be wrapped or scrolled. So if you have, uh, if you have badges on top of your dashboard, you can now scroll them. Um, you can put them at the bottom, the top, or just wrap them, or you can scroll them. There's a improved user experience when using templates and automation scripts. There's a lot of stuff in this thing. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail. You can read about it in the blog and see it in action on your own device. So if you're a power user, you use templates and automations, you're probably familiar with that. That UI falls back to YAML if something doesn't actually work in YAML or in the UI itself. So instead of falling back to all the way pure YAML, it only falls back to the code editor for fields containing an action template. So in this case, you'll see that all the, the remaining UI stuff is in here, except for this one little piece that needs some YAML work. So instead of turning all this block into YAML, it's gonna only turn this one little section into YAML and you can add, edit this YAML within the actual UI itself. So that's a nice thing to have there. Um, it basically says it allows you to use the UI for most of the automation while still being able to use templates where needed. And you can also make it easier to understand what this is doing because you have all of this information easily readable and then just a little bit of templating work there. And you can paste automation in the scripts, the YAML directly into the UI. It will go in there, it will format it uh, and do all the work it needs to do to make it work for you and it will um, change it into the UI editor and be converted to UI format. Whether you paste it example is a full-blown automation or single trigger condition or action. So you can post some of it and uh, some of the automation and it'll convert it where it needs to. So that's nice. And they have a little demo video on their blog. And then if you want to know what Home Assistant is looking at in all of your uh, networks and things that you're running, you can go into the... Um, the tool and find that out. So if you go to system settings network, so if I go to settings network, there we go. And I can look down here at network discovery. I can see what's showing up in my DHCP. I can see what's showing up in my SSDP. So all of these devices are showing up in that particular protocol. And you can also look at the zero conf browser to see what all is showing up on there. Tons of stuff to look through. And that's for power users who really want to get into stuff. Um, so there you go. Another long video on a few topics, but man, every time they release a home assistant version, lots of stuff to play with, lots of stuff to play around with, and lots of new fun stuff. I can say stuff many times, can't I? But with that, I'm going to leave it with you and uh, appreciate those that watched all the way to the end. Thank you for that. And uh, if you aren't a subscriber, do the thing and we will see you on the next one.